Hello, hello, everybody back from uh, their morning break. And we will jump into our afternoon session. I'd like to quickly introduce our speakers this afternoon. Our first speaker talking about uh, maternal sepsis is Dr. Ron Gibbs. Ron had a long and uh, successful eminent career at the University of Colorado, where he was the chair of the department of OBGYN. He's held multiple positions, uh, including president of the Infectious Disease Society for OBGYN. And he's the lead author on the CMQCC toolkit on improving the diagnosis and treatment of maternal sepsis. Currently, he is the Knowles Distinguished Scholar and Clinical Professor of OBGYN at Stanford. Um, after that talk, Dr. Matthias Brizzoni will be giving an update on pediatric surgery. Matthias is an associate professor of pediatric surgery here at Stanford. He has multiple titles, including um, directorship of the Pediatric Surgical Fellowship, directorship of the Bariatric Surgical Program at Packard, and also the Outpatient Pediatric Surgical Clinics. He also runs a Hispanic Center for Pediatric Surgery and has interests in minimal access surgery, neonatal surgery, and uh, gastroschisis uh, repair. And our final faculty of the afternoon is going to be Dr. Tricia Wright. She is a distinguished fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine and professor of OBGYN and reproductive science at UCSF. Um, she has a master's in clinical research and is a member of the committee which published the ASAM practice guidelines for the treatment of opioid use disorder, which was updated in 2020. So with that, I will drop out and hand the stage over to uh, Dr. Gibbs. Thank you, Ron. Uh, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to a computer near you rather than uh, in the glorious Monterey. So on behalf of my co-authors at the CMQCC task force, I'm absolutely delighted to make this presentation entitled Improving Diagnosis and Treatment of Maternal Sepsis. Rather than being a lecture though, this is going to be a guide to the toolkit uh, and how to use it in very practical settings. The toolkit was released in January, 2020, just a few weeks before the pandemic hit us. And since then it has had over 1700 downloads in 49 US states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico and 59 countries. So we believe that it has already had impact. Next slide, please. I have no disclosures to make relative to this presentation. And next slide. Uh, the learning objectives have been uh, distributed and we will now work through the lecture. Next slide. So uh, it is a very widely and publicized fact that overall maternal mortality in the United States, as shown in the left panel, has been gradually increasing. That is, it has been increasing in every reporting jurisdiction except California. And as shown in the right panel, maternal mortality in California has decreased. And this very important decrease is largely attributed to the work of the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative. Next slide. Uh, the Maternal Quality Care uh, Collaborative is uh, a multi-stakeholder uh, organization which has uh, pro provided a number of toolkits already and the Sepsis Task Force uh, Advisory Group uh, consisted of 25 members representing a number of disciplines, nursing, pharmacology, infectious diseases, maternal fetal medicine, neonatology, uh, and representing both private and academic uh, organizations. Most of the members were from California, but we had members representing the state of New York, which had its own uh, maternal uh, sepsis task force, and also uh, Dr. Melissa Bauer from the University of Michigan. Next slide. 
By way of introduction, we wish to emphasize the importance of maternal sepsis. It occurs infrequently in just about 0.04% of deliveries, but it is a leading cause of maternal death, estimated to be around 13 to 23%. And why this toolkit was so timely and so important is that almost two thirds of maternal deaths from sepsis are likely to have been preventable. And maternal death is just the tip of the iceberg because for every case of maternal death from sepsis, there are 50 other cases uh, in which women experience life-threatening morbidity from sepsis. Next slide. Well, as shown on the right panel, the leading causes of pregnancy-related mortality are medical causes. In aggregate, these are cardiovascular diseases, cardiomyopathy, stroke, and other medical conditions. But if we look at the left panel, we see that among the primarily obstetric causes, infection and sepsis are uh, the leading causes, outranking hemorrhage, pulmonary embolism, hypertensive disorders, and amniotic fluid embolism. And these are late data from the Centers for Disease Control. Next slide. Well, listed in this box are the leading causes of maternal sepsis. So in the antepartum period, there are complications of early pregnancy loss or septic abortion, chorioamnionitis, lower respiratory infection, pyelonephritis, and appendicitis. If we shift to the intrapartum or the immediate postpartum period, chorioamnionitis ranks right up there, endometritis, again pneumonia, again pyelonephritis, and then we see wound infection and very serious complications of wound infection, such as necrotizing fasciitis. When we get to the post-discharge period, then the ranking causes include pneumonia and influenza, pyelonephritis, still wound infection, but then we see breast infection and cholecystitis as well. Next slide. We'll have a number of key clinical pearls to make as we go through this presentation, but the first that we want to make is that prompt recognition and rapid treatment of maternal sepsis improve outcomes. And a number of the tactics and strategies that we're going to use will emphasize the importance of rapid recognition and rapid intervention. Next slide. So uh, further regarding uh, the introduction, we want to say that the diagnosis of sepsis in pregnancy may be difficult. It can be difficult in all adults, but it's more difficult in pregnancy because the physiologic changes of pregnancy may mimic the very signs of sepsis. So we know that, for example, pregnant women have an increased heart rate, that there is a decreased blood pressure in pregnancy, particularly in the second trimester, that there is an increased white blood cell count in pregnancy, uh, particularly in labor, and particularly uh, in labor, there is an increased lactic acid level. So the criteria for diagnosing sepsis in non-pregnant women uh, do not perform well among pregnant women, and therefore we felt we needed to come up with a different schema. And we know that pregnant women are increased at increased risk for severe outcomes in some infections, such as influenza, and now we better add also COVID-19. Next slide. The definition of sepsis has been changing and the 2016 Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines overhauled the definition. So sepsis is now defined as life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response. In the past, sepsis accompanied by organ dysfunction was called severe sepsis, and the term severe sepsis is no longer used. Septic shock is a subset of sepsis in which there is underlying circulatory and cellular abnormalities that are profound enough to substantially increase mortality. Next slide. So we're going to break the presentation down into several parts. And the first part would be exactly how do we go about screening for sepsis and how do we make the diagnosis? 
Next slide. Well, as noted, the current screening systems perform, uh, perform poorly in pregnancy. They just don't detect enough cases or there are too many false alarms. So in the toolkit, we have come up with a two-step approach for the diagnosis of sepsis during pregnancy and particularly in the immediate postpartum period. So the first step is a screening step, and this is limited to things that you can do easily. Bedside vital signs as adjusted for pregnancy and a recent white blood cell count. So this is low tech kind of stuff. And if a pregnant person is screen positive and will detail how they become screen positive, then you go to the second step, which is a diagnostic step used for evaluation of end organ injuries, again, with laboratory values adjusted for pregnancy. Well, the utility of lactic acid during labor is much debated, but women with elevated values do require careful and specific individual attention. Next slide. So here are the criteria for initial screening for sepsis, step one. And we point out in red that if a pregnant person has two or more of these criteria fulfilled, then they are said to be screen for sepsis positive. So this would be an abnormal temperature, either greater than or equal to 38 degrees C or less than 36 degrees C. A heart rate, which is greater than 110 beats per minute and sustained for 15 minutes. A respiratory rate greater than 24 breaths per minute and sustained for 15 minutes. And a white blood cell count greater than 15,000 or less than 4,000 or with greater than 10% uh, immature neutrophils or bands. So these are adjusted for uh, the physiologic changes of pregnancy. They are particular for pregnancy and uh, they are different from the criteria in non-pregnant adults. Next slide. Well, now here is a slide that you really can't uh, uh, worry about right now, but we have this in the toolkit. This is great to put in your uh, electronic medical record to put in your labor and delivery or postpartum protocols book. And we labored mightily over this. This must be about the 40th edition of this uh, flow sheet because we wanted to get just the right amount of information in there. So let's break this down and we'll go to the next slide. So the first part of this algorithm or flow sheet is the initial sepsis screen. So for individuals as shown in the gray boxes with suspected infection, routine vital signs and a white blood cell count screening are done. As we've just gone over, an individual is considered to be screen positive if any two of the four criteria are met. And then immediately action is required. So if there is suspected infection as the cause of these abnormalities, start source-directed antibiotics, which we'll get to shortly, and begin one to two liters of intravenous fluids. Increase monitoring and increase surveillance, and then move to the second step, which is a confirmation of sepsis. That was noted by this uh, orange ellipse on the right side. If the mean arterial pressure is less than 65 millimeters of mercury, and it's confirmed, uh, in the individual with uh, infection, this directly defines septic shock. Next slide, please. So then what is step two? Step two is a confirmatory step looking at tests to evaluate end organ injury or organ dysfunction. So in the flow sheet, you will see that these include a CBC, coagulation studies, a comprehensive metabolic panel, a lactic acid, and then bedside assessment of urine output, pulse oximetry, and mental status assessment. Next slide. Well, in the toolkit, 
these are the criteria that we have, again, adjusted for physiologic changes of pregnancy. And if an individual who is screen positive has any one of these criteria met, then they fulfill the criteria for the definition of sepsis. Well, these are just too hard to commit to memory, but we want to say that, for instance, there would be indicators or criteria for respiratory uh, function, such as need for invasive or non-invasive ventilation, or coagulation abnormalities, such as low platelets or prolonged partial thromboplastin time, or abnormalities in the liver, uh, uh, indicated by a bilirubin of greater than two, or abnormalities in blood pressure, or renal function. And because GFR increases and creatinine and BUN go down in pregnancy, uh, we indicated that fulfilling the criteria for renal dysfunction is a creatinine of 1.2 milligrams per deciliter. Well, that's still in the normal range for many adults, but in pregnancy, it indicates renal dysfunction. And then be on the lookout for mental status changes, agitation, confusion, unresponsiveness, and check the lactic acid as well. Next slide. So here we then come to the bottom half of this flow sheet. And uh, at the top of this uh, part, there is step two. So after your evaluation of step two, there are four possibilities. We'll start over there at about uh, two o'clock. And if one or more of these criteria is positive, this defines an individual with sepsis. So what action should be taken? Well, Start source-directed antibiotics if it's not been done already. Uh, make sure that there is increased fluids at least to 30 milliliters per kilogram within the first three hours. Maintain close surveillance, perhaps escalate care, such as uh, getting your rapid response team uh, or considering movement to an intensive care setting. Now, down there at about uh, five o'clock, as we go around, there is the individual who has a mean arterial pressure of less than 65. And with confirmation, this defines septic shock and the actions are shown in the box, including moving the patient to an intensive care unit. Now, there at about seven o'clock, we have uh, individuals who have elevated lactate only in labor. Well, this, uh, indicates a patient who requires additional surveillance and additional uh, uh, caution and further uh, evaluation. And then we have the individuals as shown there at about eight o'clock, all criteria are negative. So this is an individual who has been screened positive, but fulfills none of the sepsis uh, a criteria, none of the end organ damage, but this group remains at high risk for sepsis and requires close supervision and evaluation. Next slide. Well, we propose that the advantage of this two-step approach will be that it promotes fewer missed cases, that is, has a higher sensitivity, a better ability to detect women with sepsis that it promotes fewer false alarms, that is, that is, has a higher specificity. And from looking at reams of data of normal women, we estimate that only 2% of patients will be screen positive, And therefore we think that there should be few false alarms. Next slide. So here's the second clinical pearl. And this links back to the importance of early diagnosis. All members of the clinical team should maintain a high index of suspicion and embrace a non-hierarchical communication to detect impending sepsis. All team members should feel empowered to speak up and know that their input is valued by the care team. So open, multi-way communication and everyone counting. Next slide. Well, the second part is the uh, assessment and treatment of care bundles. So next slide, please. 
So again, sepsis means an individual who has been screened positive with end organ injury. And again, we want to say source directed antibiotics have not already started. If the source is unclear, give broad spectrum antibiotics as we'll go over shortly. Increase the fluids, repeat the lactate, blood cultures if not already drawn, and get help, such as by calling for the rapid response team to escalate care. Next slide. Well, here are the key principles of this section, and they include one, act quickly upon recognition of sepsis and septic shock. Two, minimize the time to treatment. Sepsis is a medical emergency. Three, monitor for response or lack of response to your interventions and communicate sepsis status during bedside care and at handoffs. Next slide, please. Well, what about the fluid management? Well, optimizing circulating volume and improving cardiac output and tissue perfusion are the goals. The initial resuscitation includes at least 30 milliliters per kilogram of intravenous crystalloid within the first three hours. And then following the initial fluid resuscitation, additional fluids should be guided by frequent assessment of hemodynamic status, such as by using non-invasive cardiac output monitoring. And the members of the rapid response team can help with providing input and assessment. So the problem with uh, continuing to uh, administer fluids without measuring hemodynamic status is that there may be a pulmonary injury from the sepsis itself and then setting the stage for fluid overload and pulmonary edema. Next slide. Well, uh, here would be some criteria, some examples of transfer to a higher level of care. This would be hypotension despite fluid resuscitation or need for administration of vasopressors. Persistent hypoxia, so at uh, 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 right here at uh, uh, level uh, ground zero, uh, an SpO2 of less than 92% on room air. Or someone who has altered mental status, including combativeness, confusion, and disorientation. Next slide. Well, you're probably all familiar with what a rapid response team is. It usually is comprised of a critical care nurse and a respiratory therapist. The rapid response team supports the care team outside of the emergency and intensive care departments where you may need this extra expertise and these extra hands. And the rapid response team is particularly useful for obstetric units where critically ill patients are fortunately uncommon. So the RRT can assist with assessment of a deteriorating patient, provide early intervention, and make recommendations for laboratory tests. Next slide. So uh, criteria for uh, transferring to the ICU. Uh, the transfer to an obstetric patient to a higher level of care is usually sought for clinically unstable patients and multidisciplinary input into the decision-making may be uh, very helpful. We wish to emphasize that safe transport of critically ill obstetric patients to a different hospital requires continuous cardiac monitoring, pulse oximetry, venous access, and assessment of vital signs. But do not delay the transport of a critically ill pregnant woman because of inability to monitor the fetus. As emphasized here in red, stabilizing the mother will often stabilize the fetus. Next slide, please. Then there are a host of additional considerations in uh, the toolkit. Some of these will take place in a labor and delivery unit, and some of them will be uh, deferred to the intensive care setting. So the vasopressor of choice in pregnancy is norepinephrine. Ionotropes may be uh, needed and dobutamine is recommended, uh, but this will probably be an ICU uh, decision. Glucose control, also an ICU decision. But fetal lung maturity, this will take place likely in the obstetric unit or with obstetric consultation once the individual 
is in the ICU and steroids are not contraindicated in a woman in sepsis. And based upon the ALP study, uh, this should now be given in pregnancies between 23 and up to 36 weeks. Next slide, please. So now we come to the antibiotics and source control. Next slide. Well, here are the key principles. Number one, Early administration of antibiotics, ideally within one hour of clinical presentation, is critically important. For every hour of delay in administering the antibiotics, there is an increase in mortality. The initial choice of antibiotics in critically ill patients is generally empiric, and broad-spectrum uh, antibiotics are used to cover most or all of the likely or suspected pathogens. There's not time to wait for results of the culture. And we have uh, antibiotic selections, which we'll go over in just a minute. And then there needs to be assessment of source control. Source control means surgical or percutaneous uh, removal of the source of infection or debridement. And these should be initiated in a timely fashion. And the key word here is using the least effective approach possible. Next slide. So in the toolkit, there are a number of tables that look just like this sample. So in the left column, there is the uh, infection. In the next second column is the antibiotic choices, giving um, not only the antibiotics, but the dose and the route. Then recommendations about the duration of the antibiotic uh, regimen. And finally, some notes of particular uh, to cases involving as in chorioamnionitis, whether the chorioamnionitis occurs with a cesarean or with a vaginal delivery. So no need to go through the details of these now, but these are all available in a readily uh, usable format in the toolkit itself. Next slide. And then uh, also in the toolkit, we have uh, this chart, and this comes from a Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine uh, review uh, done by uh, doctors uh, Plan, Pacheco, and Lewis uh, about two years ago. And this recent review lists various sources of infection down the left column and the antibiotic recommended regimens in the right side of the box. Uh, so by either using the charts in the toolkit or this, one can devise ideal regimens for the empiric treatment of the infection, severe infection or infection with sepsis uh, in an empiric fashion. Next slide. Well, imaging studies are often very important in identifying the source of the infection and for dictating how to obtain source control. So here is a CT scan of the cross section of a woman post cesarean section. And as you can see in the center upper portion of this scan, there is a moth-eaten, multiloculated collection. This is an abscess between uh, the uterus and the abdominal wall. And because this is in proximity to the abdominal wall, it is ideal for percutaneous drainage. And the next slide shows the placement of a pigtail catheter and satisfactory drainage of this uh, abscess in interventional radiology and resolution of the infection. So this is an example of source control by percutaneous drainage using the least invasive approach. Next slide. Now, another circumstance would involve necrotizing fasciitis. And this is diagnosed clinically in the presence of fever, pain out of proportion to the exam, crepitus, boule, 
erythema, and rapid progression of findings. And prompt surgical management of necrotizing fasciitis confirms the diagnosis and early debridement is critical. Next slide. Well, this slide shows a wound after a cesarean section. And you can see the redness around the margins. And in the upper edge, you can see this grayish, blackish area with bullae. This is an individual who has necrotizing fasciitis. This is an individual who must go to the operating room for surgical uh, debridement and often repeated planned visits to the operating room for surgical, for source control by surgical debridement are necessary. Next slide. Well, there are other circumstances where uh, open laparotomy is necessary. And this is a case I was involved in a number of years ago in a woman who had group A streptococcal corporal sepsis. She had over two and a half liters of purulent acidic fluid and her infection was only controlled by uh, removal of the infected source, uh, the uterus, and by debridement and cleansing the abdomen. Next slide. Well, then there are specific obstetric considerations and the principles are shown on the next slide. We wish to emphasize that the timing of delivery in a pregnant woman who is septic should be individualized, taking into consideration gestational age and maternal fetal status. A careful assessment individualized to a patient should be made uh, when regarding what sort of anesthetic to be used. Next slide. In terms of indications for delivery, this really requires exquisite care. Sepsis is not an immediate indication for delivery and the timing of delivery in a septic patient should be individualized considering gestational age and maternal fetal status. We know that improving maternal hemodynamics often improves fetal status and cesarean delivery is usually reserved for supervening obstetric indications after the patient is stabilized. And as we've mentioned already, corticosteroids for fetal lung maturity are not contraindicated and can be used between about 23 and 36 weeks. Doing, rushing in to do a cesarean section in an unstable patient may make the situation just worse. Next slide. Well, in terms of a discharge education, we'll go to the next slide. So every woman and at least one support person should receive discharge instructions on the danger signs of sepsis. Sepsis and severe maternal morbidity are prime indicators for a patient who may have early readmission to the hospital. So instructions at every point of care should include ways to decrease infection, such as frequent hand washing. And for the woman who has had sepsis, a planned follow-up contact should be made within three to four days after discharge. This could be in person. It could be by telehealth visit. It could be by telephone, but there should be a planned visit promptly rather than waiting 10 days or two weeks or even more. Next slide. So let's summarize. We wish to emphasize that the prompt recognition and rapid treatment of maternal sepsis improves outcomes and that none of the systems for adults perform satisfactorily in pregnant women. They've got low detection rates or too many false alarms. With suspected infection, a mean arterial blood pressure less than 65 is sufficient to initiate the sepsis protocol, even if other sepsis screening criteria are not met. And as we've gone over, we've recommended a new two-step approach to the diagnosis. And this inv involves a screening step followed by a confirmatory step. Next slide. So we, we believe that the two-step approach will not have uh, very many false positives and that early administration of antibiotics is critical and critically important and ideally within the first hour of presentation. The initial choice of antibiotics in critically ill patients is generally impaired 
and broad spectrum to cover all of the likely or suspected pathogens. And source control by surgical drainage or by percutaneous drainage or by debridement should be initiated in a timely fashion using the least invasive approach. Next slide. Well, let's take a case to illustrate some of these points. So here we have a disguised case, but it's based upon a real case of a 26-year-old, a gravity 2 para one who was hospitalized with premature rupture of the membranes at 32 weeks. On day eight of hospitalization, uh, the individual felt warm and had a racing heart. She did not have fever, but note that her heart rate was 130, greater than the benchmark of 120. Her blood pressure was okay, and the fetal heart rate was 160. She began contracting, and her cervical exam was three centimeters dilated, 80% of face, and minus one station. Next slide. A white count is obtained, and note that this was 22,000, greater than the benchmark of 15,000. The patient actually was screen positive because she had two abnormalities, heart rate and a white blood count but no sepsis confirmation was performed because she did not have fever and it was not clear what the source of infection was. And then there was an explaining away. The white blood count was attributed to the beta-methasone she had received four days earlier. Well, two hours later, a repeat cesarean section was performed because of a non-reassuring fetal heart rate tracing. Next slide. An infant is born with an APGAR of one and eight. In the recovery room, now she develops full-blown sepsis. Her temperature spikes to 101.8. Her heart rate is elevated at 120. Her mean arterial blood pressure is down at 56, and her respiratory rate rises to 36. Rapid response team is called. IV fluids are given, and zosin is administered for um, infection of unknown source, and a lactate is up at nine and her urine output drops to 10 milliliters. Next slide. She also has bleeding at her infection site and she's transferred to the ICU, stabilized on broad spectrum antibiotics and supportive care. It is no surprise that the final diagnosis is septic shock due to chorioamnionitis with bacteremia due to two organisms, group B streptococci and E. coli. So next slide. So what are the lessons learned here? No fever initially, and that lulled the care team into a sense of complacency, but the patient did meet the initial screening criteria because of her elevated white count and her heart rate. And with lack of sepsis confirmation testing, there were missed opportunities for earlier treatment with fluids, broader spectrum antibiotics, and to avoid progression to septic shock. And there was the lulling uh, into a sense of complacency by explaining away the white blood count as being due to beta methasone. Next slide. So I also want to wrap up by saying that there are a number of very useful appendices in the toolkit. I hope that this guide to the toolkit will prompt your institution to take a close look at it, to use a number of the tools to make them available either in the electronic medical record, to make the antibiotics available, to work with your pharmacy team to get antibiotics to your patients rapidly. So next and last slide, uh, this is the uh, contact source cmqcc.org. And at this point, I think we're about 30 seconds early and I'll be delighted to answer any questions. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ron. This is Valerie Kate from CMQCC, and I'm gonna pose a few questions that have come in to um, Dr. Gibbs uh, about the presentation. So how might you encourage a resident team who feel they can manage this type of patient to consult a higher level of care coordination and not call rapid response to help guide them in this decision? Uh, so the question is how to uh, encourage a resident team to go to uh, other to their senior attendings? Yeah, or to consult um, a higher level of care coordination process. Yeah, okay. So uh, 
Th that is so critical. I'm glad we started with that question. So everybody's input is valued. Uh, and uh, we don't want to get caught in this story of either complacency or explaining things away. So there has to be a high index of suspicion, a low threshold of response. So if it's a resident team, there should be a very low threshold to in kinds of patients who are showing these warning signs, who, are who have suspected sepsis or fulfilling the screen criteria to march things right up your ladder without any delay and without any hierarchy. Okay, great, thank you. We have about three more questions, so this is good. Do you know what the current antibiotic recommendations for choreo, endometritis, and sepsis are? Yeah, okay, so uh, the, this is a point of a very interesting recent debate. So what we've been using are targeted organism, uh, targeted antibiotics, for the suspected organisms. And these include uh, group E strep and the gram negatives like E. coli and the host of anaerobes uh, as well as other aerobes. So traditionally we've been using ampicillin plus gentamicin in someone who, uh, uh, who delivers uh, uh, vaginally and then for someone who has chorioamnionitis and requires a cesarean delivery, adding that additional anaerobic coverage of say, clindamycin. Now last December, a very thoughtful uh, expert opinion review appeared in the gray journal by Dr. Roberto Romero from the NIH. And he put forward the idea that we should expand our uh, spectrum to include the genital mycoplasmas, and I'm just going to check this. So he, his recommendation was a combination of ceftriaxone, good aerobic gram negative and group B streptococcal coverage, metronidazole to cover the anaerobes, and clarithromycin, a drug aimed particularly at the genital mycoplasmas and a drug that does have good a placental transfer. So that's ceftriaxone, metronidazole, and clarithromycin. But this was, I, I, Roberta was a good colleague and a good friend. We've had communications about this. This is uh, based upon the microbiology, but uh, it has not been tested on a wide scale basis. So by and large, the college, re American College of OBGYN recommendation is ampicillin genomycin for vaginal delivery, and then adding clindamycin or metronidazole for cesarean delivery. Wow, that was a long answer, wasn't it? Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, are there any precautions on large fluid volumes for sepsis in pregnancy? Yeah, o okay, so uh, it's, it's a two-edged sword. You want to give enough uh, fluid to uh, make sure there is adequate cardiac output and adequate uh, perfusion of end organs. On the other hand, there can be damage to, say, the endothelium of the lung from the sepsis process. So the empiric recommendation is to give the 30 milliliters per kilogram in the first two to three hours. And if that doesn't uh, maintain uh, your blood pressure and support your organ perfusion, then individualize subsequent fluids by use of non-invasive cardiac uh, output uh, monitoring, uh, such as with the advice of the rapid response team. Okay. Any, are there any likely to be any um, calling the rapid response team too frequently with the proposed two-step method? Well, we, we need to um, do a prospective evaluation. We suspect that this will not have very many false alarms based upon our data from healthy pregnant women and what their vital signs are like. So uh, we, we do wish to uh, evaluate this, something called the COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, Valerie, has got in the way of our uh, ability to evaluate this on a statewide basis. We, we definitely have that in mind. We want to evaluate that. But at this point, we feel that the much greater danger is missing 
early opportunity for intervention. Okay. Um, is there any recommendation for vaginal prep for a C-section on a patient with a trial of labor or ruptured membranes? Kind of yes or no, and, and, and why would you do either? Yeah, uh, so uh, this vaginal prep has been the subject of several review articles. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vincent Bergella from Philadelphia has written uh, one of those uh, systematic reviews. So the rationale for it is uh, a good one because many of the organisms that get up into the uterus uh, after a cesarean come from the lower genital tract. Um, and there have been a number of randomized trials looking at that. And the systematic review did recommend uh, doing a vaginal prep prior to at least uh, emergent cesarean deliveries. It's a safe, inexpensive intervention, and it appears to reduce the risk of infection. Great, thank you. And the last question that um, I'll propose as we end the session is, any, any ideas in terms of what's coming next in research related to sepsis, what's in store, anything happening on a national level? that we want people to be aware of? Well, I, I think the whole idea of recognizing pregnancy as a special circumstance is most important. In the surviving sepsis campaign, pregnancy or pregnant women is not mentioned once. Uh, so there are very special considerations, physiologic changes, special kinds of infection, special toxicity, special needs for antibiotics that we've gone through in this presentation. And uh, uh, the leadership of CMQCC has engaged a discussion with the leaders of the sepsis world. And we do hope to be able to uh, put forward recognition of the special circumstances of pregnancy so that we can provide better care for pregnant women uh, in all uh, circumstances, not just in California, but around the country as well. Thank you. I have to say we had one more question come in, if you wouldn't mind answering it, about that recommended vaginal prep. Would you do chlorhexidine or betadine? Uh, I, I think the systematic review uh, recommended either chlorhexidine is easy and inexpensive and non-toxic. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions as we get ready to close this session? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gibbs, for giving such a great um, overview of the toolkit and providing information that will help clinicians make a distinction of what, how they need to consider pregnant women in a special light for, for sepsis. We appreciate your presentation. Uh, we will turn the, the next session over to Dr. Matthias Brizzoni, and he's going to be presenting a pediatric surgery update. So we uh, ask everyone to go on to the next section. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all. Thanks, Valerie. Thanks, Melissa.